All right, and we are live. I am Dan Crozier. I'm in the tiny little box uh, up in the corner there with the, the weird blue light and uh, the fleshy uh, skins in the background. <laughs> and uh, I am your host for this fantastic reading. It's Kofo and Hex Publishers presents the Undead Readings from It Came From The Multiplex. Woo! All that fun, weird shit. So, guys, uh, we are joined with Josh Viola. Yay. That's why I'm here. Publisher. And, you know, the, uh, the partners on this endeavor, uh, Brett and Jeannie Smith, they're, they're up in the corner, kind of faded in the background. They're a tiny little panel. So, uh, guys... Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about yeah you know, how this uh, uh, this anthology came to be before we introduce the authors? Well, I I can give my version uh, of the of, of that story. <laughs> um, uh, Brett had asked uh, Ellen Datlow. Uh, to to do the uh, anthology, and she said no, no damn way. If Josh Pyle is involved, uh, no. I uh, Ellen's a uh, those watching. If you're not familiar, a phenomenal, well, probably the uh, editor uh, uh, for horror anthologies, and I I wish to emulate her, um, but I'm not even close. Uh, I got to know Brett and Jeannie through the convention circuit, which is how I met you, Dan. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they reached out to me after they said you guys were putting together Kofo, um, uh, and we had uh, some drinks over at my place before uh, the world started burning um, about a year ago, and uh, kind of discussing just some ideas about what an anthology would be for your uh, for your convention. Uh, mm -hmm. We obviously knew it was going to be horror, and um, I, I think we all just had a burning kind of uh, love and passion for 80s movies. And, and after going back and forth and discussing, you know, what we really like uh, as far as horror is concerned, everything was a movie and everything went back to that decade. Um, and so that was, that was really where, where it took off, I think. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hex is known for putting out anthologies. You know, our first anthology was a horror anthology. Um, and uh, so I got to know some great writers and decided that that would that'd be a fun project and reached out to some people. So some cool. of which are here. Yes, excellent. Um, and, uh, you know, Brett and Jeannie, did you want to uh, say anything about the project? What he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember sure. going back to a meeting with you, Dan, in the at Mutiny Information Cafe. Mm -hmm. and talking with Dwight Thompson and we all thought, you know, we need a her convention in Denver. Of course, the, we put one together with the Colorado Festival of Horror. We had the pandemic, of course, come in and we got to put it off a year. But we had worked with, decided to work with Josh, the local Hex Publishers, is fantastic group. They put out incredible work for five plus years. And we're like, we got to do an anthology to coincide with the convention which today would have been the third day of the con, but we're going to put her off a year. But the book is still coming out in a couple of days. We're really excited about it. The The picture in the back is a convention exclusive cover of, of the book, but it is going to be available on all the platforms to get the regular edition on Tuesday. But working with Josh, we were like, what's the perfect thing? What's in right now? And it's all 80s films. We're seeing that on American Horror Story, and we're seeing it all over the place, a resurgence of love for those films. And it just had this idea that being inside a multiplex at midnight, <laughs> watching these kinds of movies would inspire all kinds of cool stories. It's, it's really ironic too, right? Because you, I mean, I guess you can go to the theater right now. I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> uh, True. But, uh, you know, if you're, uh, we're getting a lot of advanced reviews that are very positive and the kind of the theme that's going on uh, in the reviews are that this is just perfect. This makes up for the fact that I, that I can't go to the theater. So, um, so that's, that's pretty cool to hear. And, and, and obviously we weren't expecting that to happen. So this is a, 
a good filler kind of, you know, some replacement until we uh, were able to go back safely and enjoy the movies. So exactly. Well, Brett and I have been doing um, film on the rocks up at uh, Red Rocks because they're doing it as a like a drive in thing. Now they brought in a big screen and you just sit in the parking lot and watch movies. But um, every time we go up there, we think about one of the stories in our book. So um, being at the drive in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is one of the stories in the book actually is a um, film on the rocks reference. So, yeah, Kay, Kay mm -hmm. Nicole Davis, she's uh, a newer writer. Um, uh, she was a student of Stephen Graham Jones. Uh, uh, he's a teacher at CU here uh, in Colorado, and he actually recommended her um, uh, to me for the project. And I was uh, uh, very pleased with her story, but very pleased with everybody's story. We've got a fantastic table of contents. I think it's pretty solid. But um, yeah, uh, Kay Nicole Davis, she's hers is um, specific to what Brett and Jeannie are talking about, Film on the Rocks. If you're not familiar, if you're not here in Colorado, so maybe Betty, uh, Alvaro, Kevin, um, Red Rocks, the amphitheater, they they host these uh, movie nights. And they've, o they've always done that, um, but now I, it's more of a regular thing uh, because of COVID. Yeah, it's, it seems like an incredibly uh, uh, appropriate theme uh, during this time. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, we've got some of the, uh, the wonderful uh, authors here with us today. Uh, Alvaro uh, Zainos Amaro. Is that, yeah, hopefully I'm getting it right. <laughs> this, yep. The third or fourth time. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, and, and then uh, we've got Penny Rocksteady. You can't mess that name up. It is <laughs> it's pretty rad. And then... Uh, Kevin uh, Dilmore, correct? <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Dilmore. It's, it's close enough. It's like Big Boutet. Big <laughs> Sounds sexy. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, you, you're, you're some of the authors that uh, contributed to this. Uh, can you tell uh, uh, any of you uh, tell us a, a little bit about uh, your experience working on, on your stories? Well, I'll share. It's not necessarily about working on my story, but I seem to, I mean, at this point, Josh is saying that the, you know, COVID-19 and the timing just worked out really well for this book. But I distinctly remember him mumbling something about virus being part of his, uh, you know, advanced marketing. Strategy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Damn it, man. You're supposed to be quiet about that. <laughs> uh, was that an NDA? I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's what's uh, actually more frightening than anything right now is when I speak, I, I'm getting my face right up on my monitor. <laughs> <laughs> book is nothing in comparison to what you're seeing right now. <laughs> oh, delightfully horrible! I love it. Uh, uh, that's that's fantastic, guys. Uh, so, you know, we're we're here to to listen to, uh, yeah. Give us a snippet of uh, your stories, you know, a little bit of a taste. Um, and, uh, you know, first up, we've got uh, Alvaro uh, reading his uh, short story, Negative Creep. You ready to go, sir? I am. I'm going to read just uh, a little bit from the start of the story. As you said, it's called Negative Creep. Chop, chop, dickweed. The burly orderly jostled Daniel. Daniel's stainless steel cuffs clink, and he resumes the long march down the dreary hall leading to his new residence. Patients at the Arvada Sanatorium, formerly the Colorado State Psychiatric Institute, call this infamous cell Silent Night. Dr. Saperman pushes a gray medication cart. Daniel closes his eyes, relishing the sound of the cart's squeaky wheels. Ten feet from silent night, he stops, falling to his knees. Oh, fuck this, the orderly says. Strong hands rip Daniel's underarms and yank him off the floor, dragging him the remaining distance. A final shove slams him inside silent night's padded white interior. Dr. Sapperman lifts up a clipboard from his cart and with gleeful fastidiousness makes a notation. You don't look so hot, kid, he says. The words remind Daniel of some movie he saw years ago involving dream warriors. He doesn't respond. 
His vocal cords are shot from a night of screaming and raving. Not that much sound would get through the muzzle anyway. We good, the door orderly asks. The doctor stares at Daniel. Behave, he says, and we'll remove the cuffs tomorrow. Dr. Samperman nods at the orderly, and the orderly pushes the heavy door, which begins a ponderous inward swing. When it enters Daniel's field of vision, the door's small, double-paned, mesh-grid window offers a refracted view of the two men, appearing now as wavering homunculi. As the heavy door moves towards the latch, Daniel loses himself in time, surrendering to the infinitely satisfying whine of its rusty hinges, measuring out his heartbeats until... A week earlier, I don't think it was murder, Jared said, lowering his gaze. Dawn never hurt a soul, and they didn't even take her wallet. The four of them sat in Daniel Vita Buick Skyhawk, barely glancing at the images projected on the huge movie screen five car rows ahead. Daniel couldn't remember a time when gathering at the 88 drive-in had ever been somber, until today. Welcome to Ludlow, a tinny voice said on the car stereo. Hope your time here will be a happy one. His speech was punctuated by a beat of silence and then the heavy roar of a rumbling long haul truck. Daniel dialed down the sound. Rhonda fidgeted in the seat behind Jared. Maybe, I mean, she had been fighting with her mom. Maybe Dawn took her own life, she said. How dare you, Daniel asked, biting off each word. Easy, Tara said from the seat behind Daniel's. We're just trying to figure this thing out, Danny boy. We're all on edge, okay? So cut us some slack. Her voice went up. Am I the only one who's been hearing weird sounds recently? Oh shit, Jared said. Kind of like static, but denser somehow, Rhonda said. It's happened to me twice. A hum that gets louder and louder, Tara said. A voice underneath. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Alvaro. I appreciate it. That, My that pleasure. Was, that was great. Uh, it's a nice little taste of uh, what uh, negative creep is, is going to be. And um, yeah, uh, Alvaro, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, a little bit more about the, the story and how it uh, kind of came to be? Sure. Josh said, um, can you write a horror story that has to do with the 80s movies? And I was feeling autobiographical, so negative creep came to mind. Um, uh, I, I think that, that really the inspiration for the story was um, we live in a very sort of noisy and busy world, and uh, horror can at times be a very loud and sort of noisy genre itself. And I thought it would be fun to um, explore that and a little bit of, um, try to um, explore the idea of the importance of spending time alone in silence with your thoughts. So that was really sort of the, the theme or the idea that sparked my, uh, my story. And honestly, I had watched um, A Quiet Place, not, not uh, mm. I was thinking about A Quiet Place, and I thought, well, what if we just flipped that premise? That was sort of the, the beginning of the, of the plot. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, fantastic. Well, sweet. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Our I'd like to add, I'm, I'm going to jump in there. I'm going <laughs> to put him on, on the spot. Uh, Alvaro does the movie reviews for Hex. Um, oh, cool. So, so uh, a, a number of them have been horror movies. So that was, I thought he was going to be, you know, perfect fit. We, we worked together. Um, I published his story with, uh, in cyber world tales of humanities tomorrow. That was, uh, our first time working together, very impressed with everything that he did. And, and uh, yeah, so it just, it just worked out great because he's, he's done so many uh, hex movie reviews and we tend to argue about them. And if I don't like his review, I don't publish it. Um, <laughs> no, it, uh, he's got a great perspective uh, on cinema. And, and I, I was, he was, I think, actually think you were one of the first that I reached out to, to contribute. So thank you. Oh, it was it was great to be a part of this. Uh, I think we and I think we had worked on uh, Blood Business as well, which was another really fun uh, fun story to, to do. Called, yeah. A story called Morphing. Good stuff. 
Sweet. Well, cool. Thanks, guys. Um, so now for our second uh, short story, it's Rise Ye Vermin from <laughs> Daddy. Daddy. Thank you for that. I like how you said it. <laughs> so um, the scene I'm reading is uh, three about three scenes in, so I'm going to give you a little setup. Uh, Jen and Christy are a secret lesbian couple who work at a movie theater together. Christy's been pretending to date Rick, the manager, to get her mom off her back about Jen. But he's been acting really creepy lately. And tonight, Christy stole his wallet, so they have enough cash to run away to the city together. But then Rick catches them kissing in the bathroom after work, breaks Jen's jaw, and runs off with Christy. And now Jen's trying to find them in the closed movie theater. The glare of lights made her wince. The theater foyer smelled of stale popcorn and something else, something dry, earthy. Lighted frames around movie posters still blinked flashing incantations to the silence. The main theater yawned open to her left and to her right, the concession stand lay abandoned. There were payphones out front, but she only considered them for a second. His office was right there. And what if he locked the door behind her? Then he'd be in here with Christy and she would be useless, trapped outside until the cops got here and bumbled their way in. A red handprint smeared black goop across his office door. And there was something else, little broken pieces of wings and plastic. The door handle was still warm, left her hand sticky. She opened the door and dozens of faces leered at her. She jolted back, making her jaw screech with pain. No, the office was empty, but dozens of horror movie posters lined the walls. Freddy Krueger and Michael Myers and aliens with empty eyes. A window that looked out onto a deceptively normal looking evening was the only break in the macabre faces. Other than that, in a basic desk, chair, and filing cabinet, the office was empty. She felt like she was going to be sick again. He's got her. At least the phone was here. Every movement of her head crackled tiny bones in her jaw, ragged shards of glass that, th that threatened to poke through her cheek. Crawling things scattered when she grabbed the receiver. Filthy fucking place. The phone buzzed a busy signal again and again, and she jabbed her finger at the button, redialed, dialed home, dialed the pizza place, and busy and busy, and no help nowhere. And didn't that buzzing sound sound like more than a busy signal? Didn't it sound like something moving inside the lines? The useless phone fell to the floor, blared an indignant symphony. Zombies and maniac killers stared at her across the empty room. Where the fuck are you? The scream ripped a new tear in her cheek, sent a cascade of gore down her uniform. They must be out in concessions or in the theater or somewhere, but she felt Christy. She felt like she was close. She knew this was where he had taken her, and if she didn't find her right fucking now, something dark in her whispered that she never would. Still, Jen's hand hesitated on the doorknob. She cast one last hopeless glance around the room, and the poster for the omen flickered. More fucking cockroaches were crawling beneath the poster, and yeah, this place was disgusting, but that was a lot of bugs. Jen ripped the poster from the wall, and beneath it was a smear of something incomprehensible. Drawn in blood? No. More textured than blood, somehow worse. Sickening stains of brown and red and black with bits of legs and shells and glittering torn strips of film roughed out a vertical rectangle, taller than her shadow. Another glob of the disgusting substance smeared an irregular circle midway down the right side, fat and plump like a fist, like a doorknob. Jen's head spun. Even if this was a door, it would lead to the parking lot out back. It would have to. She swallowed and her jaw pulsed with pain. She grabbed the hunk of gore and it moved beneath her hand, twitching insect legs, warm and soft and scratching, and she turned the knob and something inside her broke when it opened. The reek of butter and rot, the sound of something shuddering in the darkness, a corridor buzzing with insects, walls winding and twisting toward a distant, sickly light. One of the bugs spun a lazy circle through the air, landed on her hand. Not a cockroach, but the size of one. Its exoskeleton looked strange, plastic, shiny, like a crumpled strip of film. And as it moved, she caught a glimpse of a woman's face, her eyes dark with shadow. 
The insect buzzed back into the air, and in the beating of its wings, the woman's lips parted and her mouth gaped open. In the distance, she heard a scream. Christy! Jen's hand sunk into the strange flesh of the tunnel. Ahead, glowing lights and posters from movies that could never have existed. Strange beating hearts and eyes that looked too familiar. Bugs swarmed her, their pulsing wings dizzying, their wings whispering her to shut up and sit down and let this all be over. She swatted at them uselessly. She ran, kept running, and finally the corridor stopped. A beautiful old-fashioned double theater door, much nicer than the ones in Rick's rundown cinema. Next to it, where the movie's poster would normally be, a stained cloth was nailed to the wall. Jen shook her arm at the insects that covered it until she could read the smears of red and black that screamed the title, Rise Ye Vermin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Gives me chills every time I hear it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Betty, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how you came up with the story? Um, I really focus, like, 80s horror movies is a big part of how I got into horror. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, with this, I just, I always come up with a couple elements for a story first. And in this one, I was really thinking about bugs and the way maybe their wings and skeletons could look like film. And that turned into, um, that turned into a weird film bug god and uh, some kind of Cindy Lauper inspired girls and yeah. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, hey, uh, Josh, uh, the book itself is coming out uh, you know, this week. And uh, for everybody watching at uh, at home, you can pre-order at uh, the Hex Publishers uh, website, right? We've got that little ticker going up. Um, yeah. Where else can you go to for uh, people to purchase it? Uh, all the major online retailers, so Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, uh, uh, all of all, anywhere that sells books uh, uh, online, you can get it. And uh, this year, we're trying to get brick and mortar location a little bit uh, tougher um, because of the current situation, but locally, at least in Colorado, there, there will definitely be a presence there, but uh, you can go to Hex and Hex has links um, to all the different retailers. But I want to mention, I, I would write, I want to go back to Betty because if you look at the cover art, uh, she's got, we've got kind of a funny story. She can tell far better than I can about oh. the cover art and her story. I don't know if I have a whole story about it, but um, yeah, it worked out really cool that the cover really, really fits with my story. Like, she looks like the character, the bugs, the everything, like, and we didn't plan that. Um, when I submitted my story and they loved it and they're like, guess what? Check this cover out. It was, it was a really cool coincidence. Nice. Yeah, after I after I read her story, I was like, "Oh my God, the art wasn't done yet." But I sent it to her. It's like, "Oh, this is perfect." It's like we were psychically uh, 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 like communicating early. She was with AJ Nazaro, who did the cover art. So kind of kind of cool. There's a lot of bugs in the book, by the way. Um, <laughs> the bugs. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, the, uh, it's, it's it seems like it was pretty serendipitous then. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, I really felt like I got the right vibe when I saw that. I was like, yes, I'm on the right track here. Nice. That's great. When cool. AJ sent us, um, he sent us several different possible covers and looking at all of them, that one was absolutely my favorite. I thought that was just the coolest thing. So yeah, everybody <laughs> was on the same wavelength. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Cool. Well, uh, if we're ready for uh, yeah, Kevin Dillmore, we're ready uh, for uh, his his uh, selection. Sure, excellent, uh, Kevin. Your short story is called Helluloid. Helluloid, yeah. And just we haven't mentioned it before, but I'm a co-writer on this. My uh, uh, writing partner Dayton Ward and I did this uh, when uh, we were invited 
to uh, take part from uh, Brett, or at least to audition. I mean, he didn't guarantee he didn't guarantee <laughs> placement. Dang him! You know, it's like you know, if we if we can cut the mustard, then we're in. So, uh, um, but since uh, whenever Dayton and I read together, we kind of go every other word, and it's a little disjointed when uh, we're doing something, you know, over uh, Zoom or or um, you know the internet like this. So I'm reading solo. But yeah, it is a story by Dayton and, and myself. Sweet. Uh, you want to go ahead? Sure. We'll start from the beginning because, as Julie Andrews says, it's a really good place to start. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yes. Uh, this also takes place in a movie theater. Um, August 16th, 1985, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tenebris, copios, exaude me. Watching the black cloaked figure sitting cross-legged in front of him, Mitch heard mumbling he couldn't understand. He leaned closer but was still unable to make it out. Is that supposed to be Latin? The whispered question came from Mitch's right and he turned to shush Evan, his friend and his classmate. Quiet, man, he said, keeping his voice low. In the light cast by candles, Mitch scanned the faces of the others seated with him around a wobbly lined pentagram drawn in white chalk on the concrete floor. To the cloaked figure's right was Kate, a senior and the oldest of the bunch. She offered Mitch a smirk and brushed back her brown bangs to better focus on the ritual. Trey sat next to her, smiling as if he had just staged the stunt of the century. Mitch shook his head. I can't believe we're doing this. From under the dark figure's hood came a low-pitched but clearly feminine voice, this time with words Mitch understood. Reekers of vengeance and spite, Arcana summons you to our bidding. No way, Evan interrupted again. Sandy? The girl's voice did not waver. You shall address me as Arcana. Horseshit, Sandy! Evan's laughter filled the dark, darkened room. I should have known, he sneered at Trey. Your gr girlfriend's a fucking witch? I prefer necromancer, Evan, replied Sandy, her tone one of loathing as she confirmed to Mitch that Evan was correct. And could you maybe not be such a dick? Trey scowled at Evan. Yeah, quit beating a dick, Evan. The senior sounded confrontational, but Mitch knew Trey was no tough guy, especially not with the Andrew McCarthy haircut he sported. Can we just do this and get back to work, please? We need to get ready for showtime. Mitch was getting the feeling this whole thing was a really bad idea. He hated coming down on his friends like this, but he was still their boss. In the spring, Mitch had been promoted to acting manager of the shifts at the Vogue Theater. It was a role he did his best to take seriously, despite his staff all being kids he knew from school and most of them a year older. However, given the circumstances, he welcomed anything that boosted morale, even a half-assed arcane ritual in the theater's basement. While it might not keep the Vogue from closing, maybe it would give the owner, Old Man Callan, a demonic case of the shits. Wicked shits, Mitch <laughs> mused, and no toilet paper. We demand your service, said Sandy, returning to her deep arcana voice. Mitch watched her right hand disappear beneath the cloak between her legs and emerge grasping a cup of blueberry yogurt. Strike down our foe, Mr. Cowan, before he wrongs us. Sandy, wait, Mitch blurted out as she brought her other hand to the yogurt cup and tore off its plastic lid. Lavatur in nobis sanguis tyrannis. She spilled the cup's contents into the center of the pentagram. Instead of yogurt, a dark red liquid struck the floor, spattering everyone sitting in the, in the circle. Kate yelped, gross, what are you doing? Before Mitch could say anything else, a hard thump shook the floor, coursing up and through his body. A sound like shattering glass rang in his ears, and for a moment, he lost his breath, like the time he stood too close to a mortar firing at the town's annual 4th of July show. Was it an earthquake? Had a car jumped the curb and hit the theater? Evan sprang to his feet and looked around as though preparing to bolt up the basement steps. What the hell was that? Adjusting the hood of her cloak, Sandy blew out the candles. The forces of retribution have been unleashed. Sure, okay. Kate cast a disbelieving look at Mitch. Should we call old man Cowan and see if he's been exercised or teleported to hell or whatever? Trey helped Mitch to his feet and then clapped a hand on his shoulder of Mitch's red blazer. Pretty cool, huh? 
Whatever. As he brushed dust off the seat of his new tacky pants, Mitch shifted to what shifted to what Evan called his boss voice. Let's get it ready to open. Trey, go see if anything happened upstairs. He watched Evan lead Trey and Sandy out of the basement before a glint of light flashed in the corner of his eye. Turning in that direction, Mitch saw that a framed picture, which normally hung above the desk belonging to the theater's custodian, Oliver Lewain, laying on the floor. Its, gra- its glass cracked in several places. Cursing under his breath, Mitch walked over to the broken picture and plucked it up. He grimaced as he studied the autograph photo of a beautiful raven-haired woman. The handwriting was exquisite as the face in the picture. To Oliver, all my best, Bettina Ortiz. Who is she? Kate asked. Don't know. Mitch laid the broken memento on the desk. Movie star from the 50s, I think. I'll bet Lewain's had it there hanging for years. Kate eyed the photo. Guess you shouldn't have invited a witch to the theater. That was not my idea. His words caught in his throat as Kate rested her hand on his wrist. Relax. Trey already took all the credit. It was a fun diversion. If nothing else, blow it off. I just, well, the whole thing kind of sucks. Mitch's eyes dropped to Kate's hand. Since Mr. Cowan announced he was closing the Vogue, he knew it was only a matter of days until he would be back to exchanging awkward hellos with Kate in the halls at school. Got another job lined up yet? She asked. I'm going to work at my uncle's greenhouse, and I can put a good in. I can put in a good word for you. It'll be fun. Mitch hadn't considered that possibility. You you want to have fun with me? Kate reached up to tug on his clip-on bow tie, which prompted a laugh from each of them. She gestured toward the pentagram and the mess left behind by Sandy. We should get this taken care of before Luann gets back. Let's get this place open, and then I'll help you clean up down here. Well, that certainly sounds like fun. She slapped his arm, laughing at him before he let her out of the basement, hitting the light switch on their way out. And I'm sure nothing scary happens after that. <laughs> so, thanks, friends. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, thanks. Yeah. So you mentioned you had to audition uh, for Brett and Jeannie. There uh, did it involve you know a, a lot of uh, Shakespearean, uh, you know, words. <laughs> I think it just it just involved us getting words on paper and in front of them, and just uh, hope for the best. <laughs> Yeah, I, I usually have a lot of success with post-it notes. That's you know, <laughs> well, well, I had, I mean, I had something going for me, which was I I worked in theaters and drive-ins um, all through uh, um, high school. Well, actually, after high school and through college. Um, so, and that was uh, I graduated high school in '82. So I was in the midst of uh, of movie theaters all through the '80s with all sorts of stuff. So it was fun to kind of you know grab ideas and just memories from friends of mine that I've worked with and try to, you know, morph them into those characters. Oh, that, that sounds wonderful. So you, you had a lot of uh, influence to, to draw back on. We, we, had, we had goofy stuff. Can I tell one story real quick? It's, it's kind of on theme that I worked at a tuplex in Lawrence, Kansas at KU and uh, uh, one of the projectionists um, who told me about, the, who taught me how to run the projectors told me about the guy who taught him and back in the summer of 1980 when we would we would build the prints um you know cut them all together and have to screen them way late at night in case something was screwed up so we could get a new uh um a reel sent to us with anything that was wrong well summer of 1980 um our friend lloyd had built up the shining and started it at like midnight or so 12 30 in the morning just to run it through and of course you know nobody ever seen it before i mean that was a cool thing about being a projectionist is we got to see stuff before anybody else and he was letting it roll and letting it roll and the tensions building and and he's in there and you know just sitting in this theater all alone and and uh they come to this part with uh jack torrance shows up at the bar and he looks one way and he looks the other he says hi lloyd a little slow tonight, isn't it? Starts laughing. Lloyd got up, walked the fuck right out of the theater, didn't even lock the doors, just left the print running and drove home. <laughs> the next morning, people showed up and there was film all over the floor. It was like, just the doors weren't locked. It was a mess. So, uh, so yeah. <laughs> not something that happened to me, but something that happened in the theater I worked in, and I got a chance to to meet the guy that it happened to. He did not want to talk about it much. 
Oh my god, that is brilliant. Oh. Yeah, that's eighties horror for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man. All right. Wow. I, I have a connection to Kevin. I haven't actually spoke about. So oh, sure. he, uh, it was a truck yeah. stop bathroom, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, close. I knew it. Close. I knew right. that would this come back to me. Ever. Brett and uh, uh, <laughs> Brett and, and Jeannie, of course, um, uh, reached out to Dayton and Kevin. I, I hadn't read any of their work before, um, but uh, years and years ago, I uh, went to the mailbox and had this this got got the mail and there was an envelope, opened it up and it was a greeting card, um, a nice nice pretty greeting card, and opened it up and it said, "Inside, I'm breaking up with you." So I've kept that card <laughs> with, with a mission to find the bastard that, that, uh, that wrote that greeting card. And, uh, and then Brett said, I've got these, these writers and, and Kevin writes greeting cards for them. So I was like, I'm going to, we're publishing him and I need his address. So when I send that check, uh, I know where, where I'm going. <laughs> so, so watch out. No. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, we, we make so much money off of good breakup cards. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's just, man, I, I knew, I knew sometime that would, that would come back to bite me. No, that's awful. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, you know, words are not for hurting. And, uh, and, and, and JC Hall who started Hallmark once said that uh, nobody ever sends a card in anger. And he was wrong. <laughs> well, I have the card framed, and now I have your address uh, on the frame. <laughs> no, well, I'm, it's, yeah, I, I, I'm curious. You know, I mean, well, first off, I'm curious if it's one of ours, and and, and if it is, um, if you send me a uh, a picture of the code on the back, I will find out who that writer was, and I I I will. I will pee on his lawn. <laughs> funny, funny enough, the address that that you gave me goes to that truck stop. <laughs> well, you know, it has been a long year. It's been a long year, and you just, you know, some sometimes side hustles are not what they used to be. <laughs> oh, oh my that's gosh! Uh, that's that's hilarious. You know, it's the modern age. You can just break up by text. I know. Yeah. Well, it was a while ago. One of, one of my favorite episodes, this, you know, hey, I like Sex in the City. I think it was a fun show. Um, but there was the, the episode where um, I think it was Carrie got broken up by Post-it Note, and that was a big deal. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it, was, it was a rough and tumble time. As long as it wasn't a Star Trek breakup card. Well, you know, um, the very first <laughs> greeting card that I ever did for Hallmark that went uh, that you know ended up on the racks was a Star Trek card. Um, I was writing for the marketing studio and got asked to write a Star Trek Valentine, which so I put Captain Kirk and um, and uh, Janice Rand, Yeoman Rand, on the cover, and they're kind of like kind of smiling at each other, and um, it says uh, underneath uh, star date 0214, you know, Valentine's Day 0214. Uh, this Valentine's Day ellipsis, and you open it up, and it says, uh, uh, I mean, like, well, it's a sound card. So, you know, that high note of the vocals of the theme comes right out, and it says, let's make a very special captain's log entry. <laughs> and I didn't really think about it other than just like, you know, Dear Diary, those, you know, those stories, you know, I never believed were true until it happened to me kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, the, the art director came up to me afterwards and said it was the nastiest card he ever done for Hallmark that actually got an approved. <laughs> <laughs> so I just didn't think that through. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, my gosh. Oh, uh, you. Yeah. You guys are wonderful storytellers, you know, both uh, in the written wor word and then uh, obviously in person with uh, with all the, you know, the, the behind the scenes stuff and, and the lives you've lived. I love it. Uh, so now we're on to Josh Viola and uh, his story is the devil's real. Yeah, R E E L, but there's double meaning. There. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll yeah, I'll, I just want to preface it very quickly. So I co-wrote this story uh, with Sean Eads. Um, uh, I was hoping he'd be able to attend today. He wasn't, um, but um, yeah, we've written numerous short stories together, and actually, our short story 
notches appeared in um, DOA 3 Extreme Horror, which is uh, alongside Betty, which is how I uh, came to know Betty and read her story in that. And I was like, oh my God, I have to, <laughs> to publish her stuff. It's She's great. Um, uh, but Sean is a um, Shirley Jackson Award nominee and a phenomenal writer and a great friend. Um, both of us, uh, we have a little bit of a similar background in the sense that we grew up in an extremely um, conservative, ultra-religious uh, upbringings, um, and satanic panic in the 80s was something we both really uh, uh, know well. And so that was the inspiration for our story. Um, and the, the the gist of it is a, a family moves to a small town. Um, their church, uh, they, they send their children to the youth group and the church has um, set up a movie night at the new multiplex that's opening up. And the kids are excited because they're going to be seeing a 3D movie. And what uh, happens is when they watch this movie and they put the 3D glasses on, um, the kids come home and they're different and their parents are uh, a little bit weirded out as to what's going on. And the excerpt that I'm going to read from real quick, picks up at the point where um, the children, um, the, the mother of the children is at the multiplex and discovers some scary stuff. So <clears throat> I, I stared at the projector and the film threaded through its two reels. I pinched the strip between my thumb and forefinger and pulled it until there was enough slack to fold the, flame, the frames up to the light. Instead of scenes, each frame showed only a child's face, recognizable even in extreme miniature. Where were Matthew and Gordon? I pulled the reels off the projector and scoured through the footage. The length of the film kept growing to become a slick, dark spool around my feet. I began to sob and slumped to the floor, buried in film, and wept out, Damn it, where are they? They're with the master. I flinched. Jacob Derinius stood in the doorway. It's never been true, you know, he said, that the eyes are windows to the soul, not until now. He held out a hand as if he expected me to take it. What have you done to my children? They were never yours, he said with a chuckle. You may birth the foal, but it belongs to the master's stable. I got to my knees, holding the endless roll of film up to him in supplication. Please tell me what you've done to them. He draped the film over his forearm and stroked it like a pet. I'll find them for you now, he said, without so much as a glance. He pulled at the film until he came to two particular frames. He placed them against his right ear and grinned. They're crying out for their mommy. He pushed the film at my face, listened to the despair of two souls burgled through the eyes. I reached out a groveling hand. If you took their souls, you can put them back. But that would inconvenience the new occupants, he said. I stared at him dumbfounded, and Dorinius shook his head. Think of the master as a realtor, each body property he wishes to acquire. The wise are glad to sell, sell to him for their own volition, but others require eviction. The children were the first, but far from the last. Tonight, after all, is the grand opening of the multiplex. There will be many screenings, thousands of tickets sold, thousands of new servants of the master, but let's make it a thousand and one. He tossed the film aside and grabbed me. I groped for my knife, lost somewhere on the floor. My fingers wrapped around the handle and thrust forward. The knife cut through fabric and flesh. Dorinius screamed and fell, shrieking in an unrecognizable language. I got up and ran. My foot tangled in the film and took it with me, trailing behind like an endless tether. It felt like a snake tightening around my ankle, and the thought made me run faster into the bowels of the multiplex. I fled without thinking, trying every door along the way. One was unlocked, and I escaped into a concrete corridor with a winding, descending path. I came to a single room a chamber. The walls were painted red and lined with symbols and writing in white. One wall held the image of a sinister goat's head, its eyes wide, glaring and defiant. Light burst from the image to a blinding intensity. I put my hand to my, hand to my eyes, fighting to see as paint on the walls blistered. I'll stop there. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much, Josh. And Thank Josh, you. can you talk uh, a little bit more about uh, uh, how and uh, how you guys uh, came up with the story? Well, yeah, I mean, we, uh, Sean and I, like I said, we 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 both grew up in that religious, um, uh, very religious background uh, for both of us. Sure. Um, and for me in particular, 
uh, I wasn't allowed to watch R-rated films. I was actually Disney movies were some of them were off limits to me because they were afraid there was a new age message. Um, and but I was so into Ghostbusters and Gremlins and uh, you know I was I was a kid in the '80s, so those were more appealing. And I'd have to go to spend the night at my friend's house um, and to watch that stuff. And then discovered Aliens, and then um, Pumpkinhead, and and uh, a lot of the horror movies that inspired me. So, um, but just just how my uh, how my parents were, how my how my family was in trying to um, censor that, only fueled this desire to uh, to go and seek that stuff out. And Sean had a, a, a bit of a similar background, and and uh, the Satanic Panic was just such a, a prominent uh, role. It, but and actually, there, there is one other thing: the the 3D glasses. Um, my brother's uh, blind in one eye, so he's never been able to um, watch a 3D movie or experience anything like that. And that was actually an idea, a plot element that's in the story, um, because the hero of the film has lost his eye and. and uh, he lost it in Vietnam. So when he goes to see this movie, the 3D doesn't work. And so, you know, what happens to those souls? Um, he's, he's, uh, he's spared uh, because of that. Um, so my brother, you know, inadvertently inspi inspired that element as well. Nice. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I remember uh, like, uh, you know, during the 80s, uh, Satanic Panic was, uh, you know, was one of the prevalent things in Colorado Springs. Uh, mm. And uh, I've, I've, yeah, Still even, is. <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. Yeah, my, yeah, my girlfriend's got, got stories growing up in a very religious, uh, um, you know, family. And then she found out that, uh, uh, her family shopped her off to, uh, a cult during, uh, the summer to help, uh, tend the farm. So, wow. uh, the, the feds ended up breaking it up. Uh, she had no idea, she, you know, uh, of course, she was like six or seven at the time. And uh, didn't realize, you know, how something like that, uh, you know, was happening even in Colorado. So, wow. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, wow. Damn. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, guys, for you know for sharing you know your works and and everything like that. It, uh, I'm really excited to see you know the book come out. I'm really excited to see it in my hand, uh, so I can you know finish reading your stories that uh, you, you've uh, been so nice enough to tease. Hold that up again, Alvaro. Yes, that is that is the book. Go, uh, go to the website, pick it up now, order your copy today, um, or hop over to Amazon. And uh, if you can, if you're in, in uh, Colorado, after what, uh, is it Tuesday that it comes out, Josh? Yeah. Yep. It's out Tuesday, and uh, we recommend you buy uh, three copies each. You know, so uh, do that. I like that. It, yeah, three is a is a great number. It's very uh, you know, it's it's almost speaks to the Trinity, Satanic Panic. <laughs> yeah, six hundred and sixty six <laughs> copies is the goal. So that's what Brett told me. <laughs> oh, I love it, uh, guys. Thanks so much, you know, for for coming on and uh, you know talking about. Uh, the book and uh, and your craft and uh, you know, you know, reading uh, some uh, some excerpts from uh, the short story. Um, is there anything else uh, that uh, uh, that we we uh, missed or need want to touch up on about this? I'm just like, and next year is when the con is going to have the exclusive right. cover. Is that right? Yeah. The Colorado yeah. Festival of Horror, uh, Brett Genie. Yeah, you know sure. anything about that. Yep, September 10 through 12, 2021. Let's get rid of this pandemic, get the vaccine going, and we'll have a have a horror show in a year. And I would like to also say thank you to um, the four authors for coming on and reading. Um, we really love the stories, and we're glad you joined us tonight. We've, we've read them many times, and many they times. never get boring. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to add something real quick. Um, I just wanted to touch on the table of contents, uh, uh, just list all of the authors that contributed. Um, so the book features Warren Hammond, Angie Hodap, Steve Rasnick Tem, Kevin J. Anderson, Betty Rocksteady, Stephen Graham Jones, Gary Jonas, Paul Campion, Keith Farrell, Oren Gray, 
Sean Eads, Mario Acevedo, Dayton Ward, Kevin Dilmore, K. Nicole Davis, Brett and Jeannie Smith, and Alvaro Zaino Somero. I'm, I hope I got it right, man. <laughs> um, I've known you for five years, so I hope I did. Uh, but um, uh, also, we dedicated the book to my friend uh, and writing mentor, Keith Farrell. Uh, he contributed a story to this, and unfortunately, he passed away in April. Um, and he was a pretty uh, uh, substantial force in, behind Hex and, and, and helped guide a lot of the projects. Um, he was a great guy and a phenomenal writer. So uh, this is one of uh, uh, his last um, stories that you can find. Um, so. Uh, and it's, it's one of the creepiest, one of the scariest. But just want to thank everybody that uh, played a role in the book and Brett and Jeannie for um, reaching out and uh, uh, asking this all to to happen. And uh, all of the authors who contributed, it's it's uh, my favorite anthology that I've had the honor of editing. So thank you all. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. <Hi. laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks to uh, you know uh, Betty Avaro and uh, Kevin for uh, popping in and, and uh, you know reading your your stories with us your your excerpts and uh, yeah. thanks again uh, to to Josh for also reading uh, your excerpt but uh, also you know helping to to put all this together this is this is a fantastic endeavor uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, Brett and Jeannie were able to to work with you guys and in, in such a, a fabulous uh, you know. Uh, way, and uh, yeah, I can't wait to to see the book and uh, and read it. And everybody that's out there, um, you know, watching, go get your fucking copy right now. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that was subtle enough, <laughs> guys. Uh, thanks again. Uh, go ahead, and stick around uh, while I uh, wrap up the broadcast. But uh, yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, you guys coming on. Thanks for having us, Dan. Yeah, yeah thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Dan. Yes. All right, and uh, everybody out there in uh, you know, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and uh, interwebs uh, land, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, you know, listening in. Definitely go go check out. Uh, you know, uh, it came from the multiplex. Uh, visit uh, hexpublishers.com. Uh, you know, you can purchase it on Amazon. Uh, if you're in Colorado, in Denver specifically, when it comes out uh, this week, see if you can uh, go to your favorite bookstore and uh, buy local. So uh, appreciate all of you uh, out there. And, yeah, everybody have a, a great uh, Sunday and be good and be kind. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>